All right, welcome back to yet another episode of Fresh Juice, an indie game podcast. I am one of your hosts, Tommy Fresh, and guess what? We are joined, as always, by Boom. Maddie Juice. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Fresh Juice. Excited to talk about indie games. We got a pretty interesting one today. It only came out a few days ago, Tom, so... I'm excited to talk about it. It's called the Cub. The Cub. The Cub. I I, I almost wanted to say the Cube. We were talking about the mm. Cube. Uh, our, our buddy Bags. I th- this might be something made up in my mind, but I think that he used to say originally that the GameCube was going to be called the Cube. Uh, so whenever I see the Cube, I think of the GameCube and and our and our buddy Chris. So uh, we do have a fun one today. It's going to be interesting. I'm I'm really interested to see what you say about this game because I have a, like actually a lot of notes on this one. It was very interesting, and yeah. you know, it, funny enough, the when I first started playing it, I I fell asleep because I I had like a really early morning, and that's not actually the review of the game. <laughs> that's not a good indicator of the game. I don't think. But I, I did play more of it today to kind of get a a better feel for it. But it's going to be fun. Can't wait to talk about it. But first, let's let's see what's going on. What's new, buddy? Yeah, um, you know, been been good. You know, we went to a wedding together over the weekend, so that was fun. Had a good time. Played some pool. Ate some good food. A little dancing. You know, and just for the listeners out there. You got to know Tommy Fresh is breaking it down on the dance floor. And if you guys aren't in the Fresh Juice Discord, link down in the description, wherever you're watching or listening, you got to join. Because there's a video in there of him just breaking it down. So that was the highlight of the weekend right there for me. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I I love dancing. If there's one thing I love, it's dancing. And... And it was it was fun. It was a great wedding. Uh, great food. Act like the food was was pretty baller. Not gonna lie, yeah. it was it was really good. And not just usually, it's the cocktail hour where it's like okay, really fun apps and stuff like that. It's like when things are really popping off. But like I was actually impressed with the entree too, which is which is pretty cool. Um, we've yeah. been to a lot of great weddings though. I you know I think weddings in general are upping their game in the food department. It's not like ten years ago when. When you're just like, ah, it's fine. We're just, you know, we're here for the wedding. But now people are, like, caring about it because I think people just talked about it so much that wedding venues are like, all right, we got to differentiate ourselves from the rest of the wedding venues out there. But it was fun. I did dance. At one point, Lady Fresh had to go to the bathroom or something like that, and and an older woman was just, she said, you look like you're alone. And I was like, I am right now. And she was... (laughs) She was all over me, and, and you know that was that was interesting. And then I had a, a, an older man that we we were really vibing as well. So uh, I'm you still doing, got it. I'm so, I That's still, what that means. I got Both it. sides, you still got it. No yeah. worries. Well, I, down. I gotta say, whoever's running for president should talk to me because I'm gonna get the senior citizen discount, not discount. <laughs> no, <laughs> the the vote. <laughs> I'm not getting the discount. But uh, no, it was a good time, man. And and. Uh, I was I was in pain the next day. I will say that not from like a hangover. I did drink quite a bit, but I was actually not that hungover. But my knee hurt, and I was like, I must hit the stanky leg a little too hard or something. Uh, it was <laughs> it was it was hurting, and my heart yeah. hurt from the Green Bay Packers losing a, a heartbreaker. Uh. I just like I hate that it ended like that. We we got to be proud of our season, but God, man, it was a dagger. It was a real dagger, but. Yeah, I was pulling for you. Yeah. It was, it was, yeah, it was a good game at least. You yeah. know, you know that's that's all you can really ask for with the season, like the Packers, right? It's just like to be competitive, mm-hmm. you know, at the at until the, the very end, you know. Uh, but they got a bright future. They got a bright future. Bright future, and it it yeah. speaks a lot about the expectations of that team because people are talking about, well, oh man, they blew it, blah, blah, blah. That was like so close. They controlled that game for so long and nobody's really talking about, they were the seventh seed playing against the first seed in the, in the playoffs. So we yep. do have a bright future. Jordan love. He's a mature quarterback for his age. He's going to look at the tape. He's going to, you know, go in and hopefully improve next year. I'm, I'm excited for it, but you know, that's that's all I want to talk about football. That's the last about football probably until next yeah. year. 
I mean, we'll probably yeah. we'll mention maybe the, Super the Super Bowl. Bowl. Maybe yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll give the Super Bowl. When the a Lions shout out. win, you know. <laughs> yeah, I would be I would be down <laughs> with that. Um, now we do have some news. First, the news from last week. If you didn't didn't quite catch it, and and Maddie also mentioned it already, we do have a Discord which you can find in the show notes. We also have it posted on socials as well, which you can follow anywhere at Fresh Juice Pod on all all platforms. I think mostly all platforms. I don't think we're on yeah. Blue Sky, whatever that is, or Threads. But you know, if if that's what you want, we we might get on there. Um, but we do have some news. So you threw some stuff in here that kind of. Uh, harks back to something we were talking about last week. Yeah, so um, Pal World. I know we we talked a bit about it last week, and uh, it's obviously an indie game inspired by Pokemon, um, and it's just been seeing some incredible numbers in terms of like concurrent players on Steam. Just looking at Steam right now, um, and it actually, uh, you know, it was kind of gradually building up, you know, since last week. Pretty much every day, there was like a, almost like another hundred thousand players added to the concurrent players, and now it has officially broken the record on Steam for most concurrent players at one time. Um, so this is actually from SteamCharts.com, which they track all the Steam games, all the activity on the Steam games, um, and the peak players, or sorry, yeah, the most concurrent is one point five million. Wow! Recently over the last 24 hours, have been on at one time. And, it, you know, it's saying, yeah, it, it did break this record. So the 24-hour peak previous record, I think, was, I don't even know if it was a million. I think that this broke through a million. Wow. Um, which is just, like, it, yeah, just incredible. And, like, honestly, shocking for me. Like, I figured that this game would, you know, probably do well if it had, like, the basics down, which it seems like it does, but... It just seems like now it's kind of taken off, taken on a life of its own. You know, like people that love Pokemon are obviously playing it, but I think people just outside of that too are really enjoying it. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely shocking to me, but this game is is just taking over the world right now in a lot of ways to how Fortnite did it, I would say. Um, and honestly, like the Pokemon formula has kind of been you know, on the back burner, left to the wayside for a while. So it's interesting to see uh, a game come out and really take advantage of it. It's not something that I'm going to be playing. As I mentioned last week, I'm not like super into the whole, you know, you can, there's like human trafficking essentially is what's going on in the game. A lot of clips I see. Pokemon trafficking. Let's just be honest. (laughs) Well, yeah. Well, no, you can capture humans in the game too. And sell them, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, and All or right. have them do, yeah. I know, yeah. But not that I would be doing that. But I'm happy people are are enjoying it. Um, but yeah, Tom, what do you think about this breaking some records here? Yeah. So it's interesting. I saw the. I had not heard anything about it, and then I saw the launch trailer last week, and that's why I put it into the the news section of the show because I just wanted to talk about it. And when I saw, I was like, wow, this at least from the launch trailer, looks better than anything Pokemon's done since Pokemon Go, right? And guess what also took the world by storm? Pokemon Go, right? So it is a a change of formula, and it looks, like, well-made, and that has always been Game Freak's problem, especially when they got into the, the 3D realm. I just feel like, even right before we start recording, I saw a meme on TikTok where it was the, they used the sound from Iron Man where the Pokemon developers are looking at Pal World and they're saying, Tony Stark (laughs) built this in a cave. (laughs) Like, you know. With a box of scraps. With a box of scraps. (laughs) It's like, it's it's pretty incredible that like, it's almost like a big eye opener for Game Freak. So I would would wonder if they're going to respond, not respond, but like, if it changes their kind of paradigm as a company as what, well, like in, in terms of what they're going to be doing. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I I'm, I'm happy to see it. Maybe I'll check it out. I don't know. Uh, but I don't, I don't, we, we had thought about reviewing it for this week, but we went with the cub. Um, I'm glad that we went with the cub because power. I mean, it doesn't need the press. I don't think, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and, 
maybe we don't want a human traffic or whatever, but um, I, I that was, that's to the extreme, you know, that's, I don't think that's how most people are playing the game, but from the clips I've seen that get viral, that's mm-hmm. what's happening in the game. <laughs> well, I saw another clip where somebody made a, a video of like what you do with the Pokemon creatures that they have, like oh, yeah. enforce them to do stuff. And they had, I mean, it was, it was pretty racy, but they had a song that should not have been being played on my feed. And I was like, this is okay. This game is going to be very controversial. Sure. Yeah. It's coming from a different culture. So maybe they don't really understand the implications in Western cultures like ours, but uh, it is, it's, Hey, whatever they're, they're doing well. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's all we could say about that. But you also put an article in here that somebody already made a Pokemon mod for it. Yeah, speaking of controversy, uh, this actually, I saw this today, um, and yeah, someone had made a Pokemon mod for Pal World already, where it changes, not only does it change the the Pals, I guess, to Pokemon, but it changes you to Ash, and a, and a Pokemon trainer, um, and it actually looks really cool, like if Pokemon did that, I would be kind of tempted, you know, in a way, if they're, you know, although you're kind of, you know, you're shooting and stuff that Ash obviously doesn't do. I think (laughs) that's still in the game. But yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of controversy over Pal World in general because of those things we mentioned. There was a whole AI thing where people basically thought, because a lot of the stuff looks similar to Pokemon. So people are like, oh, did you just take Pokemon designs and just throw them in an AI and whatever it spit out? That's why that's what's in Pal World. And now this mod, which I imagine if it hasn't been shut down already, it's going to be shut down pretty soon. Uh, so make sure you go download it if you're listening <laughs> and you're, you're playing Pal World before it gets shut down. But uh, yeah, just this game, I, I feel like the gameplay itself has kind of elevated it to you know uh, um, a, a lot of discussion, but also the controversy is just bringing it to a whole nother level. And that's probably part of the reason it's been so popular in terms of concurrent players is like people just hear about it through like controversy and they're like, Oh, I'll try it. And then they end up liking it because the gameplay is actually good. So, uh, yeah, Pokemon mod, we'll see how long that lasts. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like controversy breeds memes, whether it Mm. is in a positive light or a negative light. And I I think about a game like Fortnite, which the comparisons are going to be drawn here, right? Fortnite is a fun game, but I don't think Fortnite becomes as popular if kids aren't doing the floss and the Fortnite dances as memes like in high school and middle school yeah. and elementary school, college, any form of education. Kids are doing those dances. So like it is uh it it, it almost is like this free marketing and you know, memes are memes are powerful, and, and Power oh, World yeah. has has uh, proven that that is going to continue to be so. Which, hey, yeah, more power to them. Now, you also put something in here about a certain game that has won an award lately. Yes, uh, Sea of Stars, which uh, was the best indie game, I believe, right at the Game Awards. Um, they're actually doing something kind of interesting here, and I figured it'd be worth talking about where they're actually releasing a physical version of the game after release, like well after release, after it's already won awards. And I find this to be really interesting. It's going to be uh, $45. It's a box copy of the game. comes with a double-sided poster, sticker sheets, a slipcase, and a retro game manual. Um, And then anyone who pre-orders the physical edition will also receive a promo code for its digital soundtrack, which is pretty cool. Um... But yeah, I just thought this was really interesting, and I, I want to get your take. Like, do you think indie games should do this more, right? Because I feel like producing the disc, producing the cover art, all that sort of stuff is obviously expensive to do, right? So, you know, indie games typically don't have a very large budget, and so is it worth kind of making the digital game first? And if it ends up being successful, you kind of release the physical version as almost just like a collector item rather than like, I don't think there's going to be a lot of people picking this up, playing the actual, you know, um, physical version of the game because they likely already own the game. Uh, They might be doing it to collect, but I mean, I could be wrong on that, but I just found it really interesting. You don't see a lot of games in general doing this, let alone an indie game. Uh, But clearly they're, they're doing well financially right now. So they're going to do a surprise physical release that hopefully makes them some more money. But um, yeah, what do you, what are you thinking about this, Tom? 
I think I've seen this before with some other really successful indie games. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to think. I feel like Axiom Verge might be one, uh, mm. as well as Dead Cells might have had a physical release at some point. Shovel Knight, I'm sure, has. You know, I there was a company that was just doing them, right? Where they were doing these physical releases, like publishing them for these, these games. Yeah. I don't know. Was that if, limited run games? Limited Is run, that yes, it? yes. That okay, was yeah. It. So... And then some of them would see light of day on retail, like Walmart and, and GameStop and stuff like that, which I think is is a, is a nice way to kind of get some uh, impulse buys out of out of a game, right? You kind of see something at, yeah. at Walmart while you're like Christmas shopping. You're just like, oh, I heard about that game. They got a physical release. That's kind of cool. Maybe I'll buy it. Um, so I, I like it. I, I like physical games, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's it's nostalgic. I like the collector side of things. Obviously, I have a whole podcast dealing with trading card games, which is all about collecting and playing the physical versions of things. So I like it. I'm not too surprised, especially since it won an award. I think that's a great like time to kind of take advantage of the award and say, hey, listen, here's our I mean, you see it with like triple a stuff as well it's like here's our game of the year edition or something like that yeah um which is neat so i, I like it I, i'm a big fan of that kind of stuff and you know if, if it puts more money into indie game developers pockets so they can make more awesome games i'm, I'm all for it and maybe yeah because this is the spiritual successor of the messenger i feel like the messenger might have even had a physical release at some point Probably, yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's a just a really smart marketing move too. Like they hopefully on their cover art in the in the actual stores, they're putting a little badge on there saying like, you know, uh best indie game twenty twenty three or twenty twenty four or whatever. Uh well, I guess it would be twenty twenty three. But um yeah, no, definitely a great marketing move. And I, I do feel like I do remember, you know, other indie games doing it. I'm just not sure if it's like it was ever this soon after like winning a major award, you know, like I feel like this, they're really trying to capitalize on that momentum still. And it's still there. Um, But yeah, just really cool to see. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, like cocoon would be cool to put on physical. Like I know there's so many indie games that we play that are just digital only. Right. Yeah. Uh, Like, like the cub today, I think is probably digital only uh, from what I've seen. So, um, you know, if a game is is really successful, I think it warrants kind of having a physical release at some point, um, just so that people can collect it. Um, yeah, so very yeah. interesting. And like, I don't know. Well, we don't have any numbers on how many people played Sea of Stars. It was obviously a great game, but it is a genre that is not necessarily the most, uh, I guess, for the general public. Right, like the kind of JRPG yeah. kind of thing, classic, like retro version. And I, I feel like maybe this is also an, like a chance. They're they're looking at it like they had had already planned on making a physical copy. They just wanted to wait till after the game of the year awards. So mm-hmm. it, it just kind of lined up that they were like, all right, now this is a great chance for it to get into more people's hands, which is which is cool. And you know, hey, like you said, collector item. Is, is a great reason to make it as well. Now, yeah. So I don't, maybe we should have started with this next article because it is sad <laughs> stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, this just came across my desk about an hour ago, maybe two hours ago. But Riot Games, famous for League of Legends, Legends of Runeterra, anything to do with that IP. Um, laid off uh 530 employees just just now just this week it is uh very sad because it kind of adds and the only reason i wanted to bring this up was kind of adds to the compounding layoffs that we've been seeing i think i saw a number like 10,000 video game employees last year were laid off and you know we're in january right now and 530 is a is a pretty large chunk of 10,000. So hopefully we don't get up to that number again. Um, it's it's kind of interesting because there's no doubt that League of Legends and Legends of Runeterra are really popular games. I mean, they had a Netflix show as well that was super popular. It makes you wonder 
Where are these layoffs coming from? Is it being publicized because of the recent layoffs? What's going on here? What's your take? Yeah, no, uh, I think, you know, obviously heart goes out to everyone affected by this. And it's unfortunately, it's just something that we see. I feel like every week, you know, I'm seeing some sort of uh, game developer having to lay off people and, you know, having kind of in, in quotes, right? Like a company like Riot uh, has obviously, they've been through a lot of different controversies. Um, so, you know, I think when news like this drops, your mind immediately goes to, oh, like they are still poorly run, right? Like how could how could this happen with a, uh, a studio that has such popular games that have made so much money? And I was even thinking of like Valorant because like mm-hmm. I haven't really played League but I know in Valorant, you know, it's a free to play game, but they're like in store shop. There were like packs of skins for like eighty, a hundred dollars that people buy all the time. They put it obscene amounts of money into it. So then it gets you thinking as like a player, it's like, well, how could you be laying off so many people when like clearly things are overpriced in your games and a lot of people are buying it? And then I think it's just a matter of where that money ends up getting invested, you know, or um, or even like putting money back into the actual game itself with the server, since it is a free game. You know, a lot of their games are free. I'm actually, I'm not even sure if any of their games are paid games. Uh, so that kind of brings up that conversation of like, did that have an effect on their financial challenges? You know, if they, you know, I, I, I don't know. Obviously, I'm not going to speak for, you know, um, any of those people or try to make excuses for why this might have happened. But um, it just, it just sucks to see. And it just got, you know, with, with companies this big, it just kind of makes you think, wh- who's the next one going to be, right? Like, um, you know, is it going to be, I think Epic's already done it, uh, like Rockstar Games, like these massive developers, like when's when's Devolve or when are we going to see news about Devolve? You know, like I just, it just sucks to see, especially with how successful games have been lately in terms of sales, right? I feel like we're always seeing, you know, we were just talking about Power World, you know, like yeah. breaking the record on Steam, um, but that's the thing about games in two years, we could see an article that power world developer laid off, you know, a hundred people. And I was like, well, how does that make any sense? You know? And I really think it just has to do with like the management of the company and where, where that money ends up getting invested. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it just sucks to see just all around. It does. And, you know, 530 employees might not sound like a lot to the listener, but uh, to put it in perspective, we, we do it. That is 11% of their, yeah. their employees. So, you know, do the math real quick. That's like 5,000 employees total, maybe around there. And that is a large chunk and it could make a lot of people just feel very insecure in the video game industry going forward. And I, if I were working for a triple a studio, which I would consider riot games to be, yeah, I would be, looking for something safer as you know, someone personally who, you know, has a life and a family that I want to take care of. And, and I I don't want to lose my job. So like it's, it's, it's really hard to see. So I don't know. It's, it's really tough because riot games, so many success, like every game, it, it feels like they make is super successful. I mean, I mentioned league league is and, and this could be an argued point, but like League to me is a game that has made esports a household name, right? Oh yeah, right. I like for whatever reason, you know. I know like CS:GO has had a lot of uh, success and some other shooters and stuff like that, but League of Legends. I mean, I, the, the the viewership on League of Legends, like World Championship or whatever, is insane, and. Not only that, they have Legends of Runeterra, which is a very successful T or CCG, uh, digital CCG team fight tactics. I've yeah. I've downloaded the the Wild Rift, the League of Legends Wild Rift, on my iPhone, and that's pretty fun too. And I think actually you have to pay for that one. That is one that you, you might have to pay. It's like five bucks. Mm. But and Valorant, you mentioned Valorant, which is probably another huge esports game. So it's it's yeah. a shame to say or to see and. I I think it's uh it's it's pretty crazy you know there's some other numbers in, in here and in the first month of 2024 alone and this is coming from IGN uh, so far the number is rapidly approaching 
four thousand amid studio like that's four thousand people already laid off amid studio closures, project cancellations, and industry funding drying up in a tragic trend that seems likely to extend well into the rest of the year. So it is relevant to indie games, right? You know, yep. these are triple A studios. If if AAA can't keep up with, you know, paying people to make great games, which they do, AAA does make great games, it, it might end up being an indie game, not renaissance. We've we've already gotten to that point, but an indie game like takeover of the market share. A lot, yeah. a lot of what you've seen with uh, craft beer in the beer world, you know, I can only speak from that because I, I, I work in that. Ten years ago, craft beer started to take market share from domestic beer. Uh, we could see the same thing happen here. So it's very interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sad. You don't want, you don't want to see those, those people go, but you also hope that they use that and use their skills to make some bang in indie games for us to review. So. Yeah. So and also, you goods. know, this could also, yeah. Like, uh, you know, I, I, we, we've played so many games and, and seen so many indie developers that are from larger studios, right. That decide to build an indie studio. So, Hopefully, you know, there's some uh, kind of the silver lining here could be there could be, you know, fantastic indie studios that end up getting built out of this. And it's it's it's, you know, obviously terrible that it happened in the first place. But I feel like if it happened to me, I would be like, all right, well, I'm going to build a studio with all these talented people that were also let go. And we're going to do it the right way, you know because I'm sure they have a bad taste in their mouth, all of these developers that get laid off by their, by their studios, um, because most of it is not performance-related, right? Most of it is just restructuring, or they just need to save you know, uh, the executives' asses or whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of could be the silver lining there, but we can, we can you know, we yeah. could button that up. There. Yeah, we, yeah, we could button it up. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you're you're totally right. They're gonna if I if it were me as well, I would be looking at something like Stardew Valley, right, made yeah. by Concerned Ape, right, and just being like, that's arguably one of the biggest games ever. Oh yeah, what am I doing, letting this corporate nonsense happen? But yes. Uh, that's what this yeah. this podcast is all about. We're, we want to talk about indie games, and we have a good one. <laughs> we have a good one. We do. A uh, decent one. Well, we'll see how good it is. We're going to give it a review. Uh, the Cub, which is coming from developer Demagogue Studios and published by Untold, Untold Tales and Gamer Sky Games. It is available on Steam, Switch, and PS4. Not PS5. Uh, it is priced at 15 bucks, $14.99. And currently on sale for ten dollars and four cents. You know, gotta yes. get those four cents. It's thirty three percent off. That's a third for for the folks at home. Um, until January twenty sixth, twenty twenty four. This episode is coming out on the twenty fourth. So act fast. Uh, yeah. What is this game about? What's the elevator pitch? Yeah, so um, essentially we are dealing with a rogue light platformer um, that has a kind of cartoony art style, uh, definitely a good amount of humor injected into it, um, and essentially the setting is kind of in this apocalyptic Earth world where um, people from Earth have left Earth, and now they are coming back. Uh, they uh, they lived on Mars. Now they're coming back as Martians. And your character is a child that was left on Earth that ne- then had to adapt to the new conditions of Earth. And now these people are coming back. And you're essentially kind of running from them because they're hunting you. So that's kind of what the, the whole idea of kind of traversing through the land is. Uh, but yeah, it's essentially a platformer um, that is has some some light, uh, hot, light roguelite elements, I would say. Yeah. Um, not not like super. It, it's more platformer than roguelite, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely an interesting one. But let's uh, let's chat about that gameplay. It sure is. Think? Yeah, yeah. I I I wonder if do do they do they describe it as roguelite or like? Um, I thought that they did. Maybe they didn't. 
maybe I'm just thinking <laughs> it is because we played so many games that are platformers that are end up being roguelites. Yeah, but, I, I don't think um, this is at all, I, to be honest, at all. It, it is very much a true platformer as far as yeah. uh, I could tell. That's true. Um, much like <laughs> much like Celeste or, or, or um, Donkey Kong Country or something like that, which is going to come up in this review. I will say that. Gameplay. Yeah. Let's talk about gameplay. I'll, I'll, I'll start Let's us off. Go for it. So you got your true game uh, platformer tropes here. You know, you're, you're jumping around. There's there's ropes that you can swing off of. You're trying to av- avoid enemies. You're not trying to kill any enemies in this one. This is this is not like um, some some things like Mario, right? You're not jumping on Goombas, right? You, you you're you're running around. And you're avoiding obstacles and and enemies, as well as doing a bunch of different things. So the one cool thing I will say about the gameplay, there's just a couple of cool things, but like one of the coolest things to me was you're gonna get a blend of platformer subgenres in this game, right? There is stealth you have to worry about at one point in the game. There is the classic platformer timing stuff and then there is also the cool kind of storytelling that you're going to get from the game as well via the the platforming which which I do really enjoy. I thought that the the blend of that was really unique rather than doing something new, which I don't think they did anything new in my opinion. I I think this was this is a lot of rehash stuff but it's more like a love love letter to a lot of different platformers. And while that's great, I will say there were points where I was a little, not miffed, but I was just like bored with some of the, the kind of love letters. There is a train car level, like point in the game where it's, it's literally taken from Donkey Kong Country, I think it is where it's doing you're doing the same thing and you're not doing much different you're just jumping from train cars to train cars trying to time it perfectly and while that is very fun i do like that i've seen it i've seen it in donkey kong i've seen it in mm-hmm. in other platformers and i'm seeing it in this so that was that bothered me now another thing that bothered me about the gameplay is i felt like it was a little bit clunky and it felt like what was the the game we played uh, a couple weeks ago? Two hands was it? Was it called? Oh, hand in hand. Hand in hand. It had yeah. a similar clunkiness to that. This was a little bit better. It was a little bit smoother than that to me, and I did have fun with it. It just it felt like, and we'll talk about it when we get to the visuals. That the visuals were more important for a lot of things, and I I felt like it kind of took away from the gameplay experience for me. Now, that being said, I love the way they told the story, and we're going to talk about whether the story is good or not, but I love the way that you get the story through the gameplay. I thought that was really, really smart. And there was some unique stuff when it came to the uh, quote-unquote Martians, uh, the levels where you have to kind of face them. Uh, They presented challenges that were not different from other platformers but they were cool enough for like it to make sense as a story right and i thought that was that was pretty cool so overall i think it is a decent platformer uh i have nitpicks here there is the clunkiness of 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 the running around and and basically how your character works but i think also it could have tried to do something a little bit different and I felt like it it didn't but it did do s- stuff different in other ways and we're going to get to that but what did you think about yeah. uh the gameplay yeah no I um I definitely agree uh with you about a lot of the gameplay points and I think the reason I was calling it a roguelite is because I wanted it to be because yeah. <laughs> I felt like the character that you're playing as, and I actually, I looked up to see like, how long does it take to beat the main story? It's about a two and a half hour game. If you just do the main story, three hours, if you do main and side quests, which is probably just collecting things. 
But uh, so I, I feel like I'm about halfway through the game, maybe a little further than that. Um, and so at this point, I think I understand all the mechanics. You know, this is kind of what I'm trying to say is that I don't think there's anything I'm missing that hasn't been unlocked yet. But from, from the gameplay perspective, I did wish I, I kind of figured that at some point I'd be unlocking a new ability, maybe like a grapple or um, I don't know, just some sort of weapon, maybe something like that. And I understand it's not really a game about like combat. You know, like you mentioned, you're, you're not really fighting anything. You're just trying to avoid things. And your character is a child, right? So like they, they're very uh, whimsical and like they don't, you know, they're not really aggressive, right? It's really the Martians or the other people that come down that seem more aggressive. Uh, so I guess it maybe wouldn't work, work from like a lore sense, but I was just kind of expecting there to be kind of unlocks as I kept playing. Um, so even though the, the, the platform was fine, like you mentioned, it kind of talks, uh, you know, it kind of honors a lot of different tropes in the platforming world, um, which was, which was fun. There's even like underwater levels, which is really cool where you kind of have to go up for air, but you also have to like, um, make sure you don't get caught because the Martians are like, they're, they're looking for you. Um, so that, that was pretty interesting. Uh, but I, I just felt like, yeah, it wasn't really giving me enough and, and granted, you know, um, it's a two and a half hour game, you know, maybe there's not a lot they could put in there, but maybe just something from the start, uh, that I, I just thought would be, I don't know, just make it a little bit more engaging. I, I think like, I'm, I'm totally agreeing with like your points. Um, there were a few cool things gameplay wise, like the way that they kind of introduced the next level, like they kind of have, and it's almost, I guess, like I was thinking like sort of dead cellsy, but there's kind of like these safe zones that you end up entering where like, that's where some of the stuff that you can, the collectibles you can pick up. And we'll talk about that in like the story and the art side of things, um, uh, which was interesting. And then you kind of left that area and depending on, you know, what part, what level you were kind of entering, there'd be a different way that that area kind of started. Like there was like a beehive uh, that's like, it's kind of like these pink bees and you have to, in order to progress to the next part, you have to like break through the beehive and they start chasing you throughout the level. So like, that's your motivation to like, try to get through the level. You eventually can like dodge them by going underwater a bit, which was cool. Uh, cause I was wondering, I was like, how am I going to get rid of these freaking bees? <laughs> and then that ended up happening. That, that was cool. And then you have other levels, like you mentioned with the Martian, uh, human people that are um, chasing you, one with a net, the other one's trying to shoot you with like darts. He's flying around like a jetpack. Um, so that that was cool, like to you know kind of introduce those like stealth mechanics in there because you're trying to like dodge these people. Um, but I just felt like I needed more from the character itself. Uh, everything else around it was good, but even if there was some sort of way for me to like throw something to distract you know uh, the Martians or something like that that like could give me a little bit of oh like when we talked about the game here, like I could be like, Oh yeah, I threw like a bottle over here and distracted this guy. And you could t say something totally different. Oh, I threw the bottle right at him. And like, you know, like just a little bit of more unique kind of experiences. I feel like if we both complete this game, we're going to have the same exact kind of experience because yeah. there's not a lot of like interesting gameplay mechanics that make it more unique. So that was my only issue with the, with the gameplay. Um, but I really feel like, it, it, I think you kind of alluded to this, like it's almost like I felt like story and art in this game and even sound were like a higher priority than the actual gameplay itself. And I think that's probably what they were going for. They wanted like a story driven kind of game. Um, so I can't really fault them too much for the gameplay. It just, it would have really made this, I think something special if the gameplay was, uh, had some more interesting mechanics. Yeah, and it sounds to me like, you know, you mentioned that you kind of almost wish it was a roguelike. It sounds to me like you wish it was just a straight-up Metroidvania, right? Like where your character yeah, just gets new abilities, uh, you know. It, and they probably could have done that even from a story aspect, right? Because, and we'll, we'll get to it with the, the story and the sound, but, you know, your main character here, the Cub, has a, a helmet from one of the Martians, and can hear their radio, and that's how the this cub learns how to speak English, right? Because it was raised by wolves, so, like, it never knew how to speak English until it started listening to the radio. You could do that in the game where you're just, like, finds another tool from the Martians, 
And that tool is useful to help this next level and progress you yeah. here. I think that is something that probably could have been done if they were like sat down and said, let's make this closer to a Metroidvania. I don't think you have to do it like a true Metroidvania where, you know, you had the big map and you're trying to like, you know, maybe find different bosses and stuff like that. But I think you could add that aspect to the game where it, it would it would help make the gameplay more interesting and, and different. Uh, so I don't know. That's yeah. just, that's just a note, but we yeah. did talk yeah. about the story and what, what'd you think about the story? Yeah, honestly, I, I want to finish the game because of the story. Like I, I found it to be pretty interesting and also just a lot of humor involved with the story. Um, you know, uh, like you mentioned the carrot, our character, the cub, grew up with wolves so they're very like primal like uh, you know but they also have like a sense of humor almost like um it reminded me of ang from the last or from avatar like and he got the cup kind of looks like ang too so that's probably why it was like triggering it for me but um that's kind of the, the that kind of childlike humor of just like you get these cut scenes that are narrated by the cub and they're just like, oh, the mean Martians, you know, like it's like a child talking. So I thought that was like an interesting way. And it's kind of drawings. Like we'll talk about the art, but there's a lot of a lot of the art that they're showing you in the cutscenes is like a child kind of drew it sort of. Uh, so that was that was definitely interesting and tied into the story really well. Um, but, yeah, you, you found like a, a human space helmet. And it reminded me actually of like um, uh, in God of War. There is a, uh, and I know that's not indie, but there is, you you find this guy, Mimir, and you cut off his head, but he's still alive because it's like magic and all that stuff. And he's tied to your hip throughout the entire game. So whenever there's downtime, he'll just start talking about a story or telling you lore or whatever it is. So there's really no moment of silence throughout the game. Um, or I mean, there are, but you know, it's kind of fills in those voids when you're just like on a boat and you're just trying to get from point A to point B or whatever. Um, so I found like this game had like a miniature version of that with that space helmet. I thought it was really well done um, because, you know, you're getting the kind of, you know, the whole vibe of the story is like so like pro capitalism. It seemed like like of, of like the way the humans are on right. Mars. But obviously here, like the narrative for the actual game is to show you that, you know, that's not the way you should be doing things. Um, but when you're listening in the radio, you know, it's like they're talking about um, just a bunch of, ra- I don't know, they, they might even say like pro capitalism radio or like <laughs> they're very like on the nose about it, um, which is kind of funny. Uh, and then they kind of they it's cool because that's also an element that leads into the the sound part of the game because they start playing songs as if it was the radio while you're playing through the level. So it was really cool how they kind of tied in the story with the actual sound of the game. And we'll talk about the sound in a little bit because there's a good amount to talk about there. Um, And there's also like things you can find in the game. Uh, There's all different sort of collectibles, right? Like there's teddy bears you find and you hug them and it tells you you get like, you know, six out of 12 hugs and you have to find all the teddy bears in the level. Um, You know, there's little messages you can find. There's drinks you can find, all different types of drinks and they always make you burp. So it'll be like burp, eight out of 10 or whatever. Um, one of the, my favorite things that you can do, that's like part of the collectibles is like turning on the TV, you turn on a TV and it, the game kind of focuses in on it for a second. You can't really go anywhere. And it plays maybe like a 10 to 15 second, like animated clip that is always parodying, parodying, parody. It's always a parody <laughs> of, uh, it's always a parody of something in the real world. So like the one I, I was just playing, um, earlier today, and uh, there was one that was a parody of like superhero movies, Marvel and DC, and like it's showing like these two superheroes, and then one of them lands, and the person goes, "There's the green flashlight. Who invited him?" And it's just like a, he looks like the Green Lantern, but they call him the Green Flashlight. And I was just like, "That's hilarious!" You know, there's like soap opera ones, like a film noir one I saw too. Like it's just all these ridiculous things that just kind of are. Uh, a little, little bit of like comedic relief throughout the game. So I thought that was really good and really well done. I, I enjoyed that. And it made me excited to kind of find a TV. I was like, oh, what's this going to be now? Um, which you don't really get, I think, with a lot of the other stuff that you do end up finding. There's like newspapers you can find. 
I'm not really a big reader, so I'm not reading all the newspapers, but I'm reading the headlines and stuff like that. Um, same with the messages as well. Sometimes they're like pretty long messages. I would read some of them, but I was really looking for those TVs. And then really just like the last thing in the story um, that I enjoyed that I haven't, I don't think I've gotten like too much further than this is that in one of the underwater levels, um, you're kind of dodging all these sort of electric uh, enemies that are uh, underneath the water. They're kind of just like electric coral in a way, I guess. Um, and you kind of get through all of it. And then all of a sudden there's a whale that comes and just swallows you. And you're kind of focused on the whale for a while. And then all of a sudden, like your character shoots out of the blowhole into the next part of the level. And I was like, that's such a, like, they could have easily just kind of, you know, you just <laughs> swim to the next part of the level and, and, and you're, you're good there. And I, I did find it a little ridiculous because I was like, where did this whale come from? Like, I just went through all these narrow corridors and all of a sudden there's a whale there. But I had to think, you know, the oceans, this is a platformer. It's 2D. The ocean is vast. You know, there's whales coming from everywhere. But I thought that was like an interesting kind of part of the story in a way uh, that whales still exist on Earth, too, um, after all, all this sort of stuff. Um, there was even a, a newspaper article. I'm just reading some of my notes here that like. Uh, it had like Jeff Bozo like oh, yeah. did something, you know, instead of Jeff Bezos, and I was like, that is hilarious. So that's kind of the whole vibe of the the game. I feel like is like this anti capitalism vibe, um, and it's just funny. Like I, I just found a lot of it a lot. I didn't realize it was gonna be that funny because looking at kind of the description in the game, you're like, oh, this is gonna be like depressing. Mm. <laughs> but they really flipped it on its head, and for me, I enjoyed the story quite a bit, and. Um, I'm excited to see kind of what happens next with it. But what about you? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the way they told the story, right? The story is yeah. good, right? You know, we, we have this character that is very clearly whimsical in a way, has that childlike wonder, even with the Martians, right? Does not, even though, like, they can kill you, right? Like, they, 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 and they do in the game, and you just kind of restart from the last checkpoint. Does not care, right? It's like kind of almost curious and then like if you beat not like beat a um martian but if you like get past the level sometimes your character will go like nah, 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 you know like kind of like <laughs> like mock them which which is really really cool and i actually really like the storytelling or like at least the world building through the newspaper articles that you find and the messages you find and you know you get some really funny moments but you also it builds out like kind of not like why everything happened but like how humanity is post apocalypse on Mars and and that's really interesting and, and and you mentioned the radio the radio is is I think the star of this game especially from a storytelling aspect or at least world building where you're getting so much you get the vibe and then you even see it in some of the cutscenes with the the Martians, they, they act a certain way. They, you know, there, there is a point where they're like, if we catch this kid, we are going to get promotions. Like that's, that's, that's all they care about. Like it's, yeah. it's just, it's so surface level that they are like that. And right. It could have been depressing, but it is also kind of like, actually, you know what we like, we, this, this cub is an example of, maybe humanity is closer to the animalistic things and the childlike wonder that we all know and that we should be focusing on. And it's, it's, it was, it was very good. And they, they built the story throughout the visuals as well, which is really cool. Like you could see stuff in the background. Like you're like, is it like an old mall or something like that? These are old trains we're, we're running through. It's, it's very, very cool. It builds the world perfectly i think that the story as well as some other stuff we're about to talk about like was a real winner and the next thing is and i just alluded to it was the visuals the visuals were great now what do you think yeah i i love the visuals uh in this game uh everything from uh you know obviously the way the level is built out to even just like the small things like when you die um you know, depending on how you die, there's kind of like a hand-drawn little graphic that pops up and it and it changes, you know, if you get killed by spikes or if you get, I love when you get captured by the Martians, it shows two of them 
with a stick in between them, and they're just carrying you in like a sack um, and taking you away. And it's really only something that's there for a few seconds. Like it's it's not really anything they needed to have in the game. It's just a nice little touch, um, and it reminds me of like. Like in Sea of Thieves, just as an example, like when you die, you can get like different colored lanterns based on how you die. And I always, I always found that really interesting because it's almost like a reward for dying, right? Uh, <laughs> that like, yeah, it's okay. You know, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a little silver lining there. Um, so I thought that was really great. And there's even a, an achievement. I got an achievement for I've died 10 different ways. Uh, so I got that achievement. I was like, oh, that's, that's cool that it's also tied into the achievements. But yeah. Um, the art I thought was great. Like I really found like the characters themselves were like kind of more vibrant than, and, and they're kind of like a, you know, a very cartoony art style. And then the world behind them is a little bit more detailed, a little bit more like monochromatic in a way where like, it's, it's supposed to be this like destitute kind of, uh, you know, apocalyptic earth that like has not been taken care of for years. Right. There's a lot of overgrown things. Uh, chains hanging from like, you know, buildings that you're swinging on. Uh, yeah. So I, I thought like the art overall was, was really great. Um, it even got to the point where, you know, uh, in these platformer games, you know, sometimes it can be really easy to establish like what's in the foreground and what's in the background. And there was a few times where like I was running through and I was like, oh, I'm going to be able to run up this rock. And like, no, the rock was in the foreground and I went behind it. So I feel like they did a really great job of like, just kind of weaving the actual gameplay track that you're running on into the environment where it felt like I was actually there. Um, and sometimes that can get a little frustrating depending on the game is like, you know, obviously if it's a game like Cuphead or something, you want to know what you can jump on and what you can't. But for a game like this, I didn't really find it to be frustrating. I thought it was just really cool, really well done. Um, and yeah, there's just the art. It had so much depth to it. Like, like you mentioned, like you could look in the background and try to figure out what things were. Um, or even like, you know, there's, there's certain, like there's like tents that you go into and you just see the silhouette of your character because you're hiding. And I just thought that was just a really cool idea. Like you could have easily just went behind the tent, right? Like you didn't have to actually go into the tent. Um, and then you can even go like, there's like a barrel you find that you hide underneath and you kind of walk you know, like that classic kind of cartoon, like I'm hiding under a bucket sort of thing with your legs sticking out. Um, so even like the small stuff like that was like really well done and just funny looking um, when when you do sort of stuff like that and kind of tied into the whole whimsical feel of like the character that you're playing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, overall, uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else art wise, but I, it's just uh, I thought it was just really well done and definitely a really strong point in the game. Uh, that tied into the story really well as well, you know. Um, you know, some of the things that you find in the game, like the messages are like these little, um, they're li little like electronic devices, you know, like they're something I've never seen before. It's just like a ball that like opens up and there's like a message in there. Like what a cool way to like show a message and also show like how progressed humanity has gotten by that point that we have those sort of things, um, you know, kind of opens up like a hologram. Uh, so yeah, just like small stuff like that. I think they got the little details right in a lot of the art for the game. Uh, there wasn't really anything I was like super annoyed with, I would say, uh, that I can think of right now at least. Yeah, it, it was really well done. I was, I was really impressed with the art. Now, initially when I started playing it, I was, I was actually worried, uh, about the, the movement and, and stuff like that. Like a lot, like I was with hand in hand, uh, from a couple weeks ago, but it, it, it was very clear to me that this character was more dynamic than those characters. Now, you know, I mentioned it in the gameplay. I do think the art almost holds back the gameplay in a little, like it's so good that it like mm -hmm. that you're almost like, gosh, like I just wish there was some more video gamey stuff going on here that I can kind of, you know, understand while I'm trying to play the game. Although, I can't really hold it back because it did really look great. The visual cues of, of what your character is doing, you know, when you're going into stealth mode, when you're behind the, the tent, that's so cool. And it just helped you understand what you're supposed to do and like what the goal is here without just flat out giving you like a little text bubble. Right. Which, yeah. you know, sometimes you need that, but if, if you can explain that without, putting that in the game. I think that's always a net positive. 
And yeah, I mean, I mentioned the backgrounds. The backgrounds looked amazing. And you get lore out of the ba- backgrounds. I mean, you mentioned the tents, but behind the tents, there was there was uh, chain link fencing with yeah. a ton of different signs to kind of show what humanity was experiencing before they had to evacuate Earth. And that is just a nice touch. I loved, um, there are animals still on this this planet, as you mentioned with the, with like the whale, but like also there's like giant dynamic vipers that are part of the environment. There are the uh, giant uh, alligators that you got to worry about yeah. that. You see them kind of just swimming around. That was just so cool. And then, I mean, I guess there was even like, like boars, like wild pigs that you got to like avoid. And they yeah. just looked great. And I, I, I thought it was, it was great. It was very cartoony, which I think is great. And, I do love the little cut scene when you die, you know, it, it, it felt childlike and you mentioned that, but it also felt like it nailed the fact that this child, this cub grew up raised by wolves. So like, like a caveman, right. Mm-hmm. And it looked like a cave painting that was drawn by a child, which was like so cool. And yeah, yeah I think the visuals were, were huge here, you know, with the one caveat that I think it holds back the gameplay a little bit, but that is uh, okay. But moving on to what I think is probably something that we probably both really agree about is the sound. And I, I just, I'll just touch on it. We mentioned that you put on the helmet and you get the radio, right? And we kind of saw this with Leica, which obviously was a game that I really enjoyed where you can kind of just listen to whatever songs that you find, throughout the game now this was a little bit different in a way where you have a live radio feed and yes we're getting lore and story from the the disc jockey in between the songs but they're just playing songs i don't know how many songs there are in the game i don't think i heard a different song i mean i think that they expect you to kind of beat the game in a relatively like predictable time. So maybe they have yeah. it time that way, but it was so cool that they were just like, here's another one from Yabba Dabba do like, here is <laughs> you know what, whatever this song is, it's crazy. And it was always really weird and like, not that different from what you would think we would be listening to in like 50 years. I don't think, which I think they really nailed the vibe of like what post-apocalyptic us living on Mars music would be right there's not a lot of acoustic instruments or anything like that because like like did they even bring it did they did the people that are saved because you got to think about it like there's this pro-capitalist message right where pro-capitalist people were the probably the ones getting saved from this apocalypse right which are probably usually upper middle class and higher. You're not getting a lot mm-hmm. of the the lower middle class and lower where you might get people that are that build guitars for a living, right? So you're just getting people who just had like turntables and stuff like that. Not turntables. That, that's what what is it, the 80s? They, they had like, you know, like really <laughs> really cool computers. And you know, yeah, we have computers. Um the computers, yeah. Yeah, computers with the, like the really like boops. with like uh not gar- with not just garage band, something better. I'm trying yeah. to think of what that Logic is. Studio. Logic Studio. Maybe I think I've heard of that. Yeah, so like <laughs> you're getting a lot of that kind of stuff with some weird stuff going on and I thought it was a it was a home run. I think the sound was was so unique it told a story it gave you world building and also was just like different it was just different every single time like a new song would come on it was really cool and on top of that um you know we we also had uh, sound effects you know if you go underground you're not getting a signal right so you don't hear the radio anymore that's a great touch and then also the the voice acting was great i totally bought the cub as the cub and uh, you know i don't think we didn't really have a whole lot of other voice acting outside of like the disc jockey and like the the other stuff but yeah you know i bought the cub as the cub the sound effects sounded great you know alligators snakes like it was all just it just made sense and i think the sound was was a home run was a real home run 
Yeah, same here. Um, you know, I think you like. I was trying to figure out how to describe the music, and I think you nailed it by saying it's like what we have now, but in fifty years. You know, <laughs> like that's that's like exactly how I was kind of thinking of it. It's like kind of this like electronic alternative-y kind of music um, that uh, is just yeah, it just seems like it's from like the future in a way. Uh, so yeah, I really, I really did enjoy the music. Uh, I, I, I also don't think I heard the same song twice, which is awesome. Um, and it's definitely something that like, it's like Wizard with the Gun level. Like I could listen to this on Spotify, you know. Um, you know, it's it's a little hype. You know, it's it's pretty hype music from what I remember most of it. Um, so you know, you got to be in the mood for that. But I, I really did enjoy uh, the music and the way it was presented with the radio was just really smart. I even wrote down something that like. They say pretty early on in the game, and they actually say one of the genres of the songs is toddler pop, uh, which is just like, that's so weird. And then the actual, the disc jockey says, ah, late stage capitalism brings me back to the good days of child labor. And I'm just like, (laughs) just like, this is like crazy it's so ridiculous and then like i was like i don't i I, do i feel bad for liking this song (laughs) you know like am i supposed to feel bad um but it really um yeah they did a great job with the sound and even you know you mentioned like going underground and you kind of like lose that radio signal um and then also if you go underwater it's like the radio is like muffled um, so you still hear everything, but it's like the dish jockeys there rah, 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 or whatever. And then as soon as you come out, so that just like these little touches that like the game did that really make a difference. You know, we've played games on the show where like they don't do those things. And, you know, it's it's obvious, you know, it takes away from the entire gameplay and story experience. So, um, you know, we can't stress enough how important sound is for a game. And this game, I think, nailed it. Like, I, honestly, for me story art and sound for this game are like you know they're they're nailing it it's a ding dong dar- darling i've been watching <laughs> i've been watching uh glow up with, with maria this is a side tangent but like it's like a show about makeup and stuff because okay. she always has it on and like the judges it's like really cool makeup it's like you know like like movie style makeup you know like intense like you know yeah. cool stuff darth maul shit um <laughs> But the like one of the judges, like, you know, every judge has to have something that they do or say where like people take it as like a huge deal, and that's what she does. She goes, "This is a ding dong, ding dong, darling." <laughs> I'm like a ding dong, like a ding dong, like the doorbell. Uh, so this for me is a ding dong, darling, right there when it comes to to the sound. Really loved it. <laughs> well, hell yeah, hell yeah. I thought you were referencing that uh, Johnny Pemberton uh, stand up bit that I had sent you. Uh, oh, ding no. dong, yeah. too many legs. Um, yeah. But uh, that's a little inside joke for the listener. Look it up. Um, but yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Story, visuals, sound, knocking it out of the park. Performance wise, I didn't have any issues. Played it on Steam. I didn't play it on any platforms uh, other than that. But uh, I would imagine it would be the same for you. Yeah, same here. Yeah, played on Steam. No issues whatsoever. And pretty confident this game is going to run well on uh switch and ps4 if the devs are listening try to get your game on ps5 because i just feel like you just should but um yeah maybe throw it on an xbox why not get all three (laughs) get crazy go for it um so let's 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 give it a rating final ratings these are ranked here's uh from best to worst uh we have certified fresh juice at the top we get a steal next right it's a great great for the price we have a get on sale we have manager special deep discount you want it on deep discount that if 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 you're not getting it for that it's probably not worth it and then spoiled milk which is the worst thing that i could possibly imagine i'm gonna give my rating first go for it so i was floating around the get on sale right the 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 gameplay being as one, in my opinion, one dimensional or not that new was kind of getting me there. And then as I played more of the game and, and kind of just really enjoyed everything surrounding it, I got to a, a very low steal, right? I, so I'm, I'm, I'm at a very low steal. I think this game is doing a lot 
right in categories that a lot of other games do not do right. And I think that is probably the best thing about this game, right? You don't get this fully fleshed out like aesthetic and and basically just artistic uh, endeavor in a lot of games. Uh, the gameplay could use some work, but it wasn't that bad. It, it was fine. It, it, it was a vehicle to deliver the other parts of the game. And I think that actually is, is fine because if, if I'm going to look at other games, you know, sometimes you can have really good uh, gameplay that's going to be a vehicle to deliver the aesthetics of the game. So I would probably rate it around the same thing as that. So I'm going to give it a very low steal. Yeah, can I just uh, say ditto? Uh, because <laughs> that's exactly how I'm feeling. I literally wrote down, uh, so I'm giving it a steal. Uh, it's a low steal for me. Um, I, I put down, you know, mechanics aren't the most unique, but I found the story, humor, music, and art style to make up for it. Um, and it, it really did in a big way. And also, like, you know, I laughed a, a lot more in this game than I thought. And, like, for me... Like, it's tough for a game to really make you laugh, I feel like, because you're focused on so many different things um, that, like, laughing about something just, I feel like it's not, especially in a story-driven game, it like, doesn't happen a lot. Um, you know, unless you're looking at a game like High on Life that's, like, made by the Rick and Morty people. It's like, that's their job, right? Like, it's to make you laugh. So I just thought that so many things were great about this game. And like you said, a lot of games kind of misstep in those areas and it ends up being detrimental to that game. So for me, you know, given this a steal, it actually makes me look forward to if they were going to do a second one. Because I feel like if they could do a second one and have, you know, a, a, a banger story, great art, great music, and improve on that gameplay aspect, which usually happens in a sequel, right? They introduce new mechanics and gameplay elements, like, this could be in the certified fresh juice category for the Cub 2, potentially. And that's, yeah, I just, like, I, I felt the same way. For a while, I was thinking, like, you know, this is, like, an on sale. It's normally 15 bucks too, so, you know, we got it for $10. Um, you know, it's a two-and-a-half-hour story. But then I started thinking about, you know, how much I love the other things outside the gameplay. It can be hard sometimes to, like, detach yourself from the gameplay because it's just, like, it's what you're doing in the game. Um, but this game really nailed the other stuff. So I'm also giving it a steal. And I have to say, if you are listening right now and you're interested in like a story-based platformer, um, pick this up for $10 because, you know, for 15 I, I, it's still worth it to me. But like 10 is like solidifying the steal mm -hmm. for me. So um, definitely, definitely do that if you're interested. And like we said, it's on Switch, Steam, and on PS4 if you're still playing the PS4. Yeah, yeah. Which I mean, yeah, you nailed it. And uh, yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that is like, let's say you want to, if you want to play a movie rather than watch a movie, play this game, right? Yeah. It's it's about the same price as a movie ticket and you don't have to buy popcorn and a soda. I mean, I mean, you can still do that. You can still buy popcorn and a soda and play this game and have a one hell of a time. But uh, yeah, I think that's what we're gonna. Yes, yeah, we're. I'm, I'm. I'm surprised that we actually landed at the same spot. Um, one, yeah, one I was thinking you were you were gonna like it less than me because yeah. I was like, oh, like because because you know your sound, you know, you know your music and your art and stuff like that. So I'm like, oh, I don't know, I don't know how he felt about the radio. But when I heard that you said that was like the the what'd you say? You said it was like the. Uh, I don't know, like the golden child. I don't, I don't oh, yeah, forget what you said. The radio was like the highlight. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, I was like, I totally agree. We're locked in. It, it it was, and like the cool thing about it, and like we could probably talk about this forever, but like the music, and you mentioned it's like you can listen to it, and it's like not. It it was like sometimes purposely not that great, which which was yeah. the best part about it. You're like you mentioned toddler pop, right? Yeah. Like I think some some people could not have the restraint to say like all right let's, we gotta actually make toddler pop here we can't just make a good <laughs> pop song so it, it was it was it was pretty neat um, but we do have some listener questions the cub was very cool uh, you know uh, it was a fun one to review 
But, uh, you know, we love our listeners. And if you want to submit a listener question, uh, please go into the Fresh Juice, the Juice Heads Discord um, and submit a question. The first one comes from someone who should be joining the Fresh Juice Discord is Kmore, who asks, you can only rate one of these certified fresh juice, creamy or crunchy peanut butter. Okay, I know where we're both landing on this, okay? I am on the creamy train. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say it like that, but I'm on the creamy train, all right? Creamy peanut butter. I don't hate crunchy. I like crunchy or chunky, whatever you want to call it. Totally fine, you know? But I have always been a creamy boy, and I'm going with creamy. But go <laughs> I, ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. I just got to write that down. Um, I am on the creamy train <laughs> maddie juice <laughs> 2024 Amazing. holy yes. smokes you don't get them like that folks um you don't? you're on the creamy train so i'm not the biggest peanut butter guy i i enjoy creamy right if i'm gonna i like a i don't do peanut butter and jelly i don't do peanut butter and chocolate i know that sounds like a sin but guess what i ain't doing it I like peanut butter in savory settings, like I like I like a lot of my nuts, um, but uh, I like them salty. All right, <laughs> this is Kmore. What are you doing? <laughs> you are just creating chaos on this podcast. But uh, we're going nuts. We're getting nuts right now. Like I, I, I'll 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 mess with a, a spoonful of creamy peanut butter. I but I also like crunchy. Ah, oh, God. This is tough. Which actually. one is certified fresh juice, though? Which one is the one that you're like, you know, you go to a store, there's nothing else in the store, but there's two jars. One is creamy peanut butter, one's chunky. You only have enough for one of them. Which one are you buying? I'm going to go crunchy. And the reason is I like peanut butter for the peanut and not the butter, right? I like yeah. I like crunchy nuts, folks. Uh, you heard it here first. I like them nice and crunchy. And that's that's what I'm that's what I'm getting into the peanut butter game for. So look at us. This is finally something we really disagree on. Uh, yeah, you're on the crunchy train. I'm on the crunchy train. <laughs> yeah, not a, or the chunky train. The chunky train. It is. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, d- interesting question, K Uh Yeah. Next one comes from Capola, our our loyal listener. Capola, hope you're recovering from your emergency surgery. We wish you the best. Yes. Uh, do you think there's an overcrowding of some genres within indie games? Yeah. Um, I think right out of the gate, um, roguelite is one that is used a lot. And, you know, to be fair, it is one that um, can be kind of twisted in a lot of different ways and still be considered a roguelite. Um, so I definitely think that's a big, big one. Uh, Metroidvania as well can be probably maybe not as much these days, um, but we could I could easily see that kind of resurging. Uh, but I would say that would probably be my pick um, is like a roguelite platformer. Essentially, is probably what is uh, has kind of been overdone at this point. But I still it's weird. I'm still interested in them, you know, because there's always those unique twists that games can have in that genre. Um, which makes it exciting. So I think that's why it's also still around. Um, but what about you, Tom? Yeah, I, I guess I would agree. Yeah, Rogue, Roguelite just sneaks into a lot of different subgenres in the indie sphere. So, like, it just is, it's almost indie. That is the indie genre. So it is yeah. certainly overcrowded. Now, I'm trying to think of something that perhaps isn't as successful as Roguelites in in uh in the indie sphere and i would say like i guess there's probably uh, if 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 we were to just go to the indie page on steam or even our phones or the the nintendo eShop, i bet we get 50 percent indie puzzle games i think oh, yeah they're super easy to make i mean not i mean i shouldn't say that but they're they're easy to easier to make Harder probably to make good. Puzzles are very hard to make good. But because of that, you can be like, here's a puzzle game that, that is hamburgers. Here's a puzzle game that's this and that. 
So I think that that might be overcrowded, but not in a way that's like overbearing, right? Because uh, people aren't like, they're not all good. <laughs> so people aren't yeah. like, you got to play puzzle fresh juice or whatever, you know? So like, oh, oh. <laughs> that's coming soon, but, uh, coming soon. Uh, but the, yeah, it's interesting. But the last question comes from yeah. Lady Fresh, uh, my fiance, who asked, or or my roommate uh, for for K more. Um, what is the <laughs> genre that will resonate with new gamers going forward? And I think in in the context that she asked this, she kind of meant like Gen Alpha, right? Like the the next generation of of kids and and gamers that are going to kind of approach indie games. Oh man, yeah. So, um, well, what would you say would be for us? What would you say is kind of like what got us? Because I don't want to make. I want to make sure I'm not saying that. For I mean, is it roguelite? I think you know, we are the roguelite Metroidvania? generation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and okay, then, yeah. yeah. So, and then Gen Z is probably a little bit of that. They probably have. Um, you know, this is just like speculation, but maybe the battle royale indies kind of like really resonate with them you know Fortnite, pal world 1.5 million players on steam i mean that that is cross-generational though so it's hard to say yeah um yeah yeah for me i mean there's kind of two ideas i have here uh one is potentially like survival crafting games it seems like they're kind of making a resurgence like this year. There are a lot. I mean, Power World is one of them, uh, you know, that it, it, they integrated those features into like a Pokemon style game. There are a ton of games coming out this year that have that um, those features built in, like Enshrouded comes out in a few days. I'll be playing that. There's Nightingale. There's Once Human I've talked about has all that sort of stuff in there. Uh, probably a bunch of other things that I'm just forgetting right now. Um, so I think that's kind of making a resurgence and that could capture kind of the next generation of, of gamers is, you know, kind of like it, maybe it did for me where I was just like enthralled by it when I first played like day Z, um, or H one Z one. And, and I just really loved it. Um, but I also think there's a, another side of it where, um, there are, uh, extraction games where like they kind of had a moment in the light and now they're kind of, I feel like they're maybe being worked on. Um, and, and maybe going to be like released maybe like next year and that'll be kind of a wave, but like games like, um, you know, I'm not sure how many of these, like you've, you've played Tom, but like, uh, escape from Tarkov or the cycle or dark and darker is one. That's like a medieval kind of extraction game. I know there's studios that currently have those sort of things in the works. So that to me, I was predicting that would be the next wave after battle Royale, but now it seems like survival games and crafting games in general, you know, Fortnite did it too. They just came out with like that survival crafting mode not long ago. So I feel like that's making a resurgence and maybe that's, that's going to be the next wave. And, you know, obviously history repeats itself. Like, I don't think we're going to get like a truly new genre coming out of nowhere in the, at least in the near future, that's going to take over. Um, I feel like it's just going to be a blending of genres and typically things these days are getting blended with like survival crafting, uh, like wizard with a gun, for example, um, or even like uh, Leica that had like some like crafting elements in there and a little bit of survival stuff. So, um, yeah, it was uh, I, I would say probably that, which is weird to say for me, but that's probably what I'd, I'd put my eggs in. It's interesting. I don't know if there's a right answer here, but, you know, and and I think that you're probably you're probably better to answer this. But when I think of Gen Alpha, I think of iPad kids. Right. So I'm trying to think of what is the most stimulating all the time, right? I think that's that's kind of what they're looking for. Whether that's some kind of hyper roguelite where it's just like you're you're constantly doing something, right? And having to restart into like, okay, I gotta go again. It's like I'm I'm being stimulated. Or it's some kind of really you know, even some pretty intense puzzle games could be something that that people like. Or it's the time wasters like vampire survivors, the Norp Apple log. It could be that kind of genre. I think anything that's going to be really stimulating is going to be uh, really popular among new gamers as they kind of yeah. come into the indie sphere. So uh, great yeah. question. I, I also, you know, I uh, just kind of thought of this, but, and I, I guess this is kind of becoming a genre, 
but a game building genre mm. like Roblox, right? Like how popular Roblox is. Most of that game is just building other game modes from what I've seen. Fortnite has it with the creative mode. That's like we talked about a gauntlet. Like someone made gauntlet in 2D on there that I played a few weeks ago on the show. Um, I think that that is also potentially something that the younger audience is really interested in. They want easy ways to make games because then that way we're, they're not really tied to uh, a specific company or, or game mode. They can just be like, oh, we'll just we'll make our own Battle Royale. We'll make our own roguelite. We'll just go ahead and do that. So, I mean, if that is considered a genre, I could see that. I mean, Ro- I'm surprised with how popular Roblox is in general, and it's clearly taken over the younger market. So who's to say that, you know, something else won't come along and, and also do the same thing and then just kind of keep building on that. Um, so that could that could also be an option too. Yeah, send us Robux, folks. Uh, we need them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you for the questions. As always, check out the Discord. It's a great place to submit those questions. Now, this is the end of the show where we talk about Rec Room. Rec Room is where we recommend something that's perhaps not an indie game um, that we want our uh, viewers and listeners to check out. What is your recommendation, Matt? Yeah, so I've got two here. One is a, is um, music, and the other is an actual actually a game or a game mode, I should say. So uh, the first one is an album called Penith. So it's P-E-N-I-T-H. Um, and it is actually a, I'm a fan of Lil Dicky, the rapper. He's got the show Dave. Um, and this is actually an, like the, basically the soundtrack from Dave, but he kind of had little small clips of his songs throughout the show. So these are like the full versions of the songs, full in quotations, you know, like uh, some of them are only like a less than two minutes or whatever. Um, but honestly it has been like, there's some songs in there that are just ridiculous that I just don't listen to. Um, like he's got a song called jail and it's just him talking basically for like six minutes about how he showed his junk at a show. It's all fake. And then he go he gets taken to jail and then like terrible things happen. Um, all that, I don't really, it's jail part one too. I guess there's a second part coming, <laughs> but I'm not going to be listening to that, but there are some tracks on here, uh, that are, are just are really impressive. Like just the way he thinks and writes, um, I've always been into like hip hop and like the way that they 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 write their lyrics um, and they're able to like tell a story. He's got some really great tracks in there. Um, obviously, it's always kind of got that like humor side of it because that's just like who he is. But Penith uh, has been great and actually just hit number one on like iTunes US today, I think, or something like that. Uh, that album. So it's it seems like it's performed pretty well. And he says there's more music coming out uh, soon as well. So it's been I think maybe like 12 years since he last released an album. Um, so it's been a pretty much of a, a dry spell here. Um, so it's been nice having some new music uh, from him, even if it is some, some, some of it's pretty silly. But I recommend tracks like Honestly, Going Gray, and Hearsay. So check it out <laughs> if, you're li- if you're listening. Those are some great, great, great tracks. Um, and then also the other thing I have to recommend is actually – about The Last of Us, um, so really popular game for those who don't know, AAA game, not indie. Uh, they have The Last of Us 1 and 2 in the show on HBO, which is great. Um, but they actually remastered The Last of Us Part 2, and what they did is they added a new mode to it. I was able to pick it up for 10 bucks because I already owned The Last of Us Part 2, so they just let you kind of upgrade to the remaster for $10 instead of 50 um, so I did that, and the no, it's a mode in there called No Return, and it is a roguelike survival mode in The Last of Us, which is really cool. So you choose, there's all different characters that have different like starting loadouts, and you essentially start in like a safe zone. There's like a little shop that like rotates out all the upgrades you can get. You can upgrade your weapons um, when you're going. Like it's been really fantastic because it's kind of every time I'm doing a run there's new stuff that's unlocked. So I complete a run, and then all of a sudden at the end it says, oh, you've unlocked, uh, it's called Gambits, but it's essentially just a challenge. So next time you go on the run, a little challenge will pop up, be like, oh, headshot two enemies or whatever it is. Uh, And then then the next run, uh, something else will unlock. So it's like every time I'm doing a run, like more features are getting unlocked as I'm doing the runs. And it's really cool because you kind of, there's like branches of levels that you can go through. And if you choose a certain branch, like you're stuck in that kind of side of the branch 
and you eventually get down to like a boss level, which I haven't gotten to yet because it is pretty hard. Uh, but it's really just like, I am so surprised with this mode, uh, the no return mode with like how, how much depth there is. There's so much to unlock, so much to play, so much replayability. It's definitely been something I've been thinking about streaming as well on twitch.tv slash Matty Gorm. Um, but it is, uh, I've really just, I, I've been like blown away by it. Like I didn't think, I was like, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll pick this up, check it out for a little bit. Um, but I will say, last thing I'll say about this, is maybe don't have it go through your speakers. Put some headphones on because for those who don't know, I mean, like The Last of Us is brutal. And I had it going through my TV speakers and uh, Maria's like cooking dinner in, in the kitchen and she's just hearing like people, like, you know, I'm I'm like, I'm suffocating people and <laughs> snapping their neck and dragging them and like people are screaming and it's just, it's so realistic, but it's also like, some of the stuff I'm like, I don't even know if I want to be doing this. Like, this is terrible. Um, but I got to do it to progress. So, you know, gamers you, got a game. You got a game. Uh, that does sound, <laughs> sound like a lot of fun. I never got to play The, the Last of Us because I um, have a play, it's PlayStation exclusive, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is on uh, PC, I think, now. But, like, it, you know, uh, yeah. I don't know if it, it was years after. So. I did watch the show. And I enjoyed the show. So that sounds awesome. Sounds awesome. My yeah. recommendation yeah. is a book. <laughs> Books, Jerry. Oh. Um, it is <laughs> It is uh, a book called uh, Between Two Fires by an author called Christopher Buhlman, who uh, he writes this, this book as authors do. <laughs> um, it, it's a medieval horror story. It is about uh, this mercenary who finds this girl who the other mercenaries he was with was probably about to do something not so great to the girl. And he says, you know what? I'm not going to let that happen. I'm taking this girl under my wing and we're going to go f whatever. And then they find a drunk priest. Uh, so what's happening is the plague has happened in medieval France. And mm. they have to kind of like go through this like desolate France with so many dead people and the reality is the and and the characters keep saying this is like god has abandoned this country demons are running rampant so they have to like they don't have to but they they keep running into like awful evil stuff and they have to try to beat that and get through it and it's so graphic and like almost like kind of depressing but but you, you get like this real dark medieval and i kind of love that and it was like so much fun to read uh it's, it's a good read it's a quick read too i think uh, you know if if you're a big reader you, you can get into it but between two fires christopher buhlman um highly nice. recommend i read that like a year or two ago and i just was thinking about it today it's a it's a great one hell yeah oh that sounds awesome yeah i actually in the show notes doc here, I thought it said between two ferns oh, yeah. until you start, until you start talking about it. I was like, I got to check the doc again. That's not right. <laughs> between two ferns is also very funny, but not yes. also funny, but is funny. And that is also something that has a similar name, but Dude, the plague is hilarious. <laughs> it's so funny. You see those masks, man. They're funny. <laughs> yeah, I love a good plague. Um, well, that's good to do for the show. The cub, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I I am uh, as always. You can find me on Twitter at Fresh Buds Pod. Check out my other podcast, Fresh and Buds, where I talk about the game Flesh and Blood. It's very awesome. I just had a spoiler video on my YouTube channel over there where I spoiled a card for the game before the set came out. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I froze my McFreshies off filming it. It was very cold in New Jersey while I was in a leotard kind of caveman outfit. It was all, a lot of fun, but uh, yeah, you can find it there. What about you? Oh, yeah. If you guys want to find me outside of the show, by the way, watch that video, all right? And let us know in the Fresh Juice Discord because it is fantastic, all right? Um, and, you know, props to you for getting all that green off. But, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want to find me outside the show, at Matty Gorm, G-O-R-M, on all the socials. Uh, I've been trying to stream a bit more on twitch.tv slash Matty Gorm, so check me out over there. Uh, and yeah, that's, uh, that's where you can find me. And I'll also, if you obviously you want to follow the show, as we mentioned at fresh juice pod on all the socials, been posting more on TikTok. had a few go up today. 
Uh, and then, of course, join the Discord. That's going to be our central hub for the show. So if you've got listener questions, if you got game recommendations, we got a new channel in there called Game Reveals that posts brand new game trailers as they're being revealed. So if you see something that looks cool, let us know in the Discord, you know, put it in the game recommendations channel. And hopefully we get some tournaments going in the near future. You know, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, so definitely check us out there. Link is in the bio. And Tom, another another great app in the books. Another great app. Maybe we can all play Pal World and we can try to enslave each other or something. That sounds like yeah. you know, just a great time. But until next time, stay fresh and stay juicy, you juice heads. Yeah.